Good afternoon, everyone. Before we begin, I would like to say that this talk will be two parts. First one is the talk, followed by a Q&A session. And good afternoon, everyone. I'm really excited to share this moment with you. This week, in metal department, we have the honor of having a wonderful maker to teach us how to make spoons, how to lick spoons, how to hold spoons, how to read spoons, how to taste spoons, to think about the relationship with spoons and intimacy between makers and creations, objects and hands. Simone Tan Hopel. This is a woman who loves hammers. So much so much that she travels with a small hammer she made as if it is a spoon. And she asked everyone from the metal department to adopt a hammer and to give the hammer some love and care, which means to give longevity to the object, to leave a positive trail behind for the next person, to gently touch, and to give soft marks to the world around you. Simone is drawn to objects like spoon because of their everydayness. She believes that, quote, when they are made by hand and with the intention to draw various issues to the fore, they transform away from the everyday, end quote. After spending a few days with her, I found that Simone is a straightforward and amiable person. Some tea and a tour around Detroit could make her happy like a child with a kite. She draws healthy boundaries in teaching and helps with her profound knowledge in making. Born in Germany and now living in London, Simone makes metalwork, gives lectures on metal smithing and crafts internationally, and curates exhibitions to bring together the voices she relates to. She received her MA from Royal College of Art in Metalwork. Her work has been selected in numerous international group exhibitions, publications, public, public collections, and many solo exhibitions. Simone said that metal is her first language and, quote, I work with the metal and I taste its edge, end quote. By looking at her work, I could hear the whisper in the language I would never understand. I can only feel and taste the simple and captivating language. Thanks to Simone, I can start to taste metal work like I can taste tea. Let's welcome Simone Ten Hompao. Hello, everyone. Oh, I can't see any of you. That's a bit disappointing. Um, so, yes, that was a really wonderful introduction. Thank you very much. Um, obviously, you paid attention. <laughs> uh, better consider what I talk in the next couple of days. So, yes, what I would like to do is, this is not a talk that goes in any form or shape chronological, and it it's a bit difficult to ask the question because this is a runaway train. I can't hold it on. So hold your questions, press your thumbs, and you remember it at the end. And what I want to do in this talk is sort of dwell a lot on spoons because obviously that's what I'm doing here. Um, give a sort of rough insight into aspects of my making. It's not all, but I'm trying to capture some of the headlines. Making really does matter to me. And the reason possibly why it does matter to me, I'm an excellent dyslexic. So I read the gray on paints, facades, or wherever, like you, most of you, would read the newspaper. So we dyslexic think a little bit different. And luckily, I had fantastic parents. My mum, my greatest hero, she realized that I need to do something with my hands early on. So I started my apprenticeship as a dual education system in a boarding school. And I became, with 19, a blacksmith, locksmith, and I had my school finishing. After that, I went to the Fachhochschule Düsseldorf, which is a kind of polytech. Studied under Professor... Becker and Frau Professor Delius, one kinetic, the other color enamel. And then I worked 
for a year in a bijouterie in Switzerland, learned how to make diamond earrings. Luckily, between the two diamond earrings, there's a head in between, so they don't have to be as symmetrical as my metalwork, which was a struggle. And then I went to the Royal College. And soon after the Royal College, I set up in London. And one of the, my first projects, because I needed to get into gear, was something to do for an exhibition. And it had to do with spoons. Because spoons, um, for me, they are tools. They are most likely the tools we learn to use to flick food and tease the parents around us and wipe everything off of their table and floors. And with some dignity, it is possibly the tool we use last. And that interests me because there is so much stuff in between. And I'm pretty sure a lot of you have somewhere a secret spoon that you remember and that means something to you. Most of my spoons have a hole. It is not important that all my spoons are highly functional in this respect. I see spoons much more that they have a conversation. They are actually an essay. An essay considers sentence and has paragraphs and it has single words. So a spoon is a word, three spoons together make maybe a conversation, a paragraph that concludes something in itself. And when you see them in rows, you can understand that they talk about possibilities, they talk about materiality, but they talk about also how it feels to have it in the mouth, to hold it, what you want to eat from it, is it savory or sweets, is it something that really teases you that you want to eat, or it is something a spoon can also make, it, make you slower in eating it, because you get sidetracked by the function and you then can focus on what you eat. You see that tools are really old, stone, uh, old tools, and these are, and I was privileged to be exhibited against these 4,000 old Flintstones, and they have similar connotation. How often have we digged out something out of the earth or done something? And it's fascinating what it takes to recognize a spoon whether it is just an outline drawing or whether it is the whole spoon or the obstruction of the spoon. And how easily can we adopt other things into it. So the sign of the spoon can also be physically the spoon that you don't see, which is buried in, in the cup. This was... Um, a collaboration i done with a fantastic ceramicist, Julian Stair. And it is often helpful to restrict what you want to say in these things. So for me, it was definitely to accommodate his stoneware, my colors, and then I used the spoon, how it works. What kind of good problem is it if you have two places for one spoon? Where do you want to put it? Do you think about the cup you drink from, or do you think, which hole do I put the spoon? And the sign is so simple. It is so obvious. And the materiality of it gives it another edge to it that allows me sometimes to render it absolute purposeless. It is the symbol of the spoon but it doesn't work in the mouth. On the contrary, I can also make a spoon that works really, it charms, it pleases the mouth. There are not that many artifacts, I would gather, that penetrates, that go into the mouth. Imagine my fingers now goes into your mouth. Although my fingers are only the extension, or they are extended through my spoons. And that's the responsibility I have with spoons, that they're really tested to the nth degree, but that they also have the ability for imagination. What kind of food, what kind of things you would drink from. These are for whiskey, 
And when you drink whiskey in Scotland, they believe you only put five drops into it. So I made a very shallow spoons so that the water gets dispersed into the cup and then you can drink it. And it changes the chemistry of it. It's also interesting to talk about location and context and sometimes I can inhabit that in a piece and the piece looks very different. When everything is in place, it's one thing and when you use it, it becomes a different thing. So sometimes it's difficult for me to just give one photograph of a piece. And location can come in many ways. You know, what is the harm of a spoon? Where does a spoon belong to? Does it need to be hidden away in a drawer or hung up on a wall? Or can it have an enclosed space that is visible for everyone? Can it sit on top of it and demand some attention? And it's still not really a spoon that works in the way you would want to put it in the mouse. It's more a symbol, a sign, a calling for attention. So spoons lead to other objects that need to work with it. They need to correspond, correspond to each other. They need to have a conversation and a relationship. And possibly the word juxtaposition is very appropriate for that. That the spoons go hand in hand with other forms and extend about the poetics of function, the absence of function, purposefulness, and the absence of any purpose. This one is, for instance, a meter long. doesn't come across necessarily in the photograph. On the other hand, there are moments when things really need to work. The, the function needs to do. There is no space for chucking something and spilling something. So when there are functional pieces, I consider these pieces in a very different way. It goes through long times of making models and finding the best opportunities how to do this. And in the doing of models, I found out that actually a teapot doesn't need the handle because I placed all the models at the end of a day to the side and always touched them at the top. And that was the experience I had. And that real, made the realization that I need something to insulate it, and then I can pour the teapot in a really light and easy way. It's, it's no strain in the hand. So this is TT, and this is Auntie. Officially, Auntie has a rock pearl, no, not pearl, rock lava uh, chain around her neck. And uh, as teapots, they ca capture the shape of it. They are this cozy kind of gemütli hygge kind of thing that distinguish them from coffee. I drink tea, so I have yet not made a coffee pot. The other aspect that fascinates me are cavities, holes, the entrance, the sort of void, the space in between. They all lead on for imagination. This is a group of pieces um, I call Torl, Torvel and Dean, of all you know them, the English ice skating couple from so many years ago. There is a function in there that there are cups and you can drink out of it. How often that will happen is the question. But I like this sort of scenario that some of the work is highly functional and other isn't. Likewise, a series of jars that are, um, you know, in my time when I was short, sweet shop, and the jar was at least that long to get the sweet out and then get that fantastic sweet into my mouth. And so I want to capture that for grown ups, that understanding that you have to make your hands slender, you can almost look into it, you wonder how you get into it, and you wonder how you get things out of it. And with the use of different material combination, in this case, alabaster, 
and brass. It allows me to, to draw that attention away from the pure function. In this group of pieces, the silver square at the bottle is something when we had glass bottles, to reuse them, they had a little nip in the bottom. It was for the transporting and cleaning them on the belt before they were filled up. And it was a highly functional piece, but it took me years to figure out. And it fascinated me. I was growing up in, in the factory of my dad. And this is a boiler house kind of thing. And it interested me also how to make a thread, a tough and die. And I bought a ready-made one and then made the other half myself. And it's fantastic that in pieces that go in exhibition and they talk about all sorts of things of splendor or function or the purity of materials, that I also have these moments where I could just explore for my own curiosity. And using different materials, like in this case, I soldered it with gold, which in itself has a bit of a problem. It's a nice discovery in my own kind of curiosity, and it holds my attention. And symbols like a funnel, they are metaphors. They allow me to, to give that understanding that if you put things on the top, it comes out in a different way. It accelerates, it speeds up, it changes it. And that shifting of... Um, information interests me quite often. So in that aspect, I quite often like to use titles. This piece is called Dip. It was commissioned by a college in Oxford. And I just thought, what can I do to get people sidetracked? So I tried to make the shape inside as pleasing and tactile and... Um, yeah, alluring possibly, as possibly can be. And that is something I use in different ways to apply a texture that either comes through really texturing it or it comes through application of certain things. Most of the time it comes through making the surface matte and drawing the intention to reading the form. The Gerbert was a series of prizes in the UK where um, the last one was in metal and it was a prize given £30,000 for the winner. And for me, it was important to have three things to apply as a strategy for it. One was that I wanted to make something people could recognize me for my materiality, my shapes, my forms. The other was um, to make meaning through the construct of material combination. And the last one, I needed to explore something new in there that hold my intention. For the duration of 12 weeks, I possibly only had one day off when I went into uni and taught, and the other days were from nine till 12, one o'clock. So I needed to have a good reason to go back into the workshop day after day and finding out things and challenging my own curiosity, my own ability of making and having that sense of risks where it work or the charcoal devil could come and take it all, which was, would be devastating. But... That is a kind of, you know, it's a good motivator to keep going. Um, you know, I was fortunate enough to win the Gerwood Prize, which is also a nice um, kind of aspect afterwards. Although I could only say that so many years later, at the time, it was a really difficult thing to accept that. For years and years you work in your workshop and nothing happens and all of a sudden all hell goes loose. And 
it is possibly really grounding to then have something to make and go back and find out other things to work and make and explore. This is a series of pieces I call, one is called Dolly and the other is called Lolly. And they are about candle holder and they get as, as mm, big and um, yeah, awkward function. They function very well, but why do you need, you can put a candle on, on a plate and it does this. Why do you need so much decoration and so much information around it? And that is possibly a question I have quite often. Uh, sometimes I really like the luxurious thing of a coral and it sits in there and we all know what corals stand for and they go in so many other things and we have seen them on rosary and other really petite things. This piece is incidentally called But Where is Lucy? Lucy the Coral. Uh, it's not set, so when the first time someone used it and tipped it over and the coral went missing. Um, likewise using stones it's a conundrum for me why do I use stones they fascinate me in one sense this piece is incidentally called uh, Rapunzel the fairy tale where the blonde princess lets her hair down and when the light is right the stone just does that a metal work doesn't need, it's not jewelry, it doesn't need that. On the other hand, they are so fascinating, these stones, these elements to put in and take away from the sparseness of the shape and the sort of minimalist in the shape. One element is silver and the other element is gilding metal. It's a metal, incidentally, I love working with because it has so many abilities to change its surface. The same one if you put a ring through something that for me means animals, bulls, they have a ring through the nose. Nowadays a lot of people put rings through their body. Uh, what does that mean? Is that a sign of uh, tagging of a kind? What kind is it? And to set that against the simple shape and a form that is called a dish, but how many people would put something onto a dish like this? The color is so voluptuous, it's not stable, I don't know. And so there's one thing obvious that I debate these things in different ways and I come to them time and time again. They are not all made at the same time, they are not all made in one year, they possibly go over 10, 20 years. And every time I go back to them, there's another aspect that allows me to improve, either technically or metaphorically, or just in the poetic of the relationship between shape, form, stone, materials. The use of enamel is I like that because I'm not an enameler. I cook it, I torch it, I do it on the house and it makes these really beautiful marks that could be like a kiss on a mirror with a lipstick that could also be a blood stain. It, could, it has everything in between, that sadness, that pain and this is something I try to bring to the fore with material and metal and shape and form that they could talk about the, the range of feelings we have and that they give imagination for it. Through metal, I express elements and they only come by using multiples. I find it really difficult to explore my intention if I do one. So most of the time, and you've seen it before, they come in multiples. And sometimes they come really in a lot of multiples. So sometimes the spoon could be 107. 
Um, these are preservative containers. They have something about, you know, keeping things forever. And they are in, these are in stainless steel. And it is about how many and how many variation. And a lot of these shapes, I bought them in an Indian shop and chopped them up and welded them back together and made other variabilities of that. So the difference between making multiples of the same seam or making three or four elements that relate to each other and talk to each other or have a codependency, in this case, these three, um, they, they are a bit like all at sea. They're floating, but then they can dock on and they have each one has something of the other or is missing something of, of the other. And that's a curiosity and it takes often clients and onlooker a little while to discover that. And that I think is quite interesting that in my work quite often I have these moments where there is an oops and a mishap and then I put gold into it because I can't fix it any other way. And then it takes people by surprise why there is this mark in there. And after a while, I realized that, that I can also cultivate that and use it. So I, in this series at Gallery Esso, I worked with a very prescribed flat range of dishes they resemble possibly the landscape where I come from, close to the border, really flat. You can see on Monday who comes to visit you on Saturday for tea. And these marks are explored and these nuances of difference. And, um, and each one of its own has a, a different material aspect. And sometimes I like to be clever that I could put Kimbu on 800 silver, which you can't do, and that is another lecture, but it just allows me to hold my attention, to challenge myself, is this possible or not? And again, like these, these are absolutely one-off, that's a namling, and that's the flux, and it, even if I would try, it's not possible to get that again, because the heat of it, and the flux, the application of the flux, won't be the same ever. We've done fly pressing a lot. That's a kind of fly pressing of a rock. Um, and this is a piece of fly pressing only on a much bigger sense. It, the piece is possibly that big, and the fly press I had was a little bit smaller than the fry press I use for you guys. So that machine you have, sorry for all the other people, it's a really useful machine you have. Um, and so there, the guy in my workshop works with sled, and I couldn't get that piece out, so it gets buried under gold. But they make make the difference. And even though that piece of gold was not necessarily where I placed, want to place it, but it brings that sort of questioning, what happened, what if, and the what, what could I do with it? So working with galleries is one thing, and working with uh, projects, which I like to do a lot, is a different thing. Uh, a colleague of mine, Juliette Bickley, and myself, we, we do under mixed metal exhibitions, usually fairs, and um, participate in shows where we set out um, experiments in order to find out how the public reads, understands, interpretates, and works with the kind of things we have so in common. Uh, the only difference is when a piece goes outside the workshop and has the expense of the space. And we want to find out what does the touching, the 
exploring of materiality and the relationship two pieces do for people who are not trained in this area. It's not about the training, but they don't concern themselves so often like we do. How often do we talk about it, this and that, and material and the relationship and shapes and positions and all this. And it's really interesting to understand that there, there is a number of people who really think a lot and they are on the same level, although they come from very different fields of work or interest. And, and then, of course, there are people who misread that, and that has a kind of really interesting information as well. And very often in exhibitions and fairs, you stand there on, on a wall, on an edge, and you just hear the people going past by and talking about your stuff as if you are not there. And in this case, we asked people, to the point that the last experiment we made, we denied them to see how they arranged things. And we deliberately wanted to put a sense of uneasiness into their observation, into being a spectator with our work. And this sort of information then feeds into um, talks and papers we talks we have done, papers we want to do. And it is, informs my making again. The last piece in the back is made only out of paper, but it has the same value as the one on the far side in silver or the one closest to me in brass. So the relationship and the value, how people, pieces act to each other, is not necessarily to do that they have to be out of a particular culture of making, mine being meta work. And it took me a while to challenge this, and it's possibly started off with using diamond or diamond-like kind of stones in, in silver smithing or metal working, and then going on and pushing this information, what is this aspect of value, is it a monetary value or can value be just about these moments where pieces sit very close to each other, may kiss, may take something for the other piece or where the, I can put this whole scenario upside down and it doesn't function in a conventional sense as a container because the container is now empty, the yellow one is emptied itself completely out, and the coat and steel one lost its content as well. So containment is another thing that I find really interesting. And during COVID, um, I got asked to make tea boxes because people had lots of money and spend it on different things, obviously tea and they wanted container for tea, quite big and quite rich and full. So that's something that I started to develop um, to make containers with tea. With my colors, they come all out of the heat. So it is really difficult to, to manipulate the inside. And, or let's put it that way. I don't see the point to break my fingers to get the inside to a standard clean door. Uh, plated or whatever. So I found a really easy solution also through COVID because I couldn't do anything other that I lined them nicely with thick paper, which I then also discovered is a really nice aspect. Whatever you put in there, it has, it's a memory holder of the smell. So the kind of tea retains in that paper. And if you want to change the tea, you change the paper as well. And making things obvious through lines and using solder and how things are constructed, that comes time and time again. And, and this sort of aspect of making, um, I've done a really early project in 2001 with a colleague 
called Andreas Fabian, um, and we went and took 21st century maker into a field and asked them to leave all their tools at home. All we gave them was silver, a tent where we eaten, uh, a guillotine and a torch and a piece of wood, uh, tree trunk where to kneel. And it is really interesting when you give people a lot of things to do, uh, you get to their, your, their brain much faster. I heard things during that time while they were making, but they could talk as well. And the struggle, a lot of them experience wanting to make as a 21st century maker with the content of the 21st century and not having that and having then to experience and explore into different ways and making other compromises how to get to that or a similar kind of aspect of it. So the field was a really important thing and in the end I took a spade and buried this one because they had the same sort of size. The, the silver piece was the same size as a spade and it seemed appropriate to leave some, something for the gods in the field, the sheep dung and everything else. Other things uh, to do about how to find a brief for a project. So this is a project where I was asked from the National Museum in Edinburgh, Glen Morangie, to um, make a piece that relates to the Pictish people, medieval silver, no, not medieval, um, Pictish. They were around 700 to 1,200. And I had this whole hinterland of the museum to explore and see. We talked with archaeologists, curators, historians. We had the most wonderful debates and I learned a lot about their knowledge. Likewise, I gave them some of mine, which I thought is obvious, but it gave me also the opportunity to realize that we are specialists but we also know a lot that academics have not a focused idea about. So I took them out of their comfort zone into a workshop and um, asked them to make some of the pieces they would have in their museum. And it was a really curious experience. Um, I have leaflets where you can go to see the films of the museum. I made a lot of models. It was really difficult to find out uh, what I wanted to make for a museum in a standalone showcase. And in the end, I went for the symbol of Scotland. So what you see is a map of Scotland there. What you see is where in Scotland there are certain moments where they found archeological things. Another project was to make um, two makers, myself and another uh, couple, got 3.3 kilograms to make a piece of molten silver from St. John's College, Oxford. And you get a slap of metal and to make something out of it. The others made, used all the three kilos and I just thought there's no need to use the whole thing. So I made a reference to the college that's the ground of the college. I made a reference that silver can shift shapes. And I made a reference to academia. So you read a lot, but in this case, I made it difficult for the academics. Very few people can read Braille. And for me, it was very important to give that sort of sense of humbleness back to people who think this is how the cookie crumbles. We do everything by writing. So these are sort of aspects that allow me to find a project and explore it. And the difficult thing was in that case possibly to give myself a brief other than I had 3.3 kilograms of silver, which in itself doesn't make a good brief. And so we, here we come back to spoons, um, tracing certain things. This is a piece of cutlery from my mum 
and it has certain significance. And carving, metalwork usually is about adding, less so about taking away because the value of the material. And in found pieces, it's really nice to have these awkward shapes. And then they come together and make another essay. And this gives you a brief insight into my making, what I can hold for a talk of whatever minutes I'm spent to talk in one direction. So what the next part of this is, the slides go on, and if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. It makes it much easier for me to have questions to respond to rather than show you who I am and what I do. Thank you.